We're glad that you are with us tonight. I have uh, forgotten my tie. It feels awkward. Uh, please uh, forgive me. Many of you have said you don't care, and I appreciate that. It's just a sort of a habit of, of mine, and uh, I sort of uh, feel unusual without it, but here we are. We're continuing our Every Book in a Word series. We're now moving to the book of Romans. Um, you know, if you ask people what the most difficult book in the Bible is, often they will point to the book of Revelation. Uh, I don't, uh, having studied it a, a good number of times, I don't necessarily believe that's the case anymore. Uh, I, I think the book of Romans might be one of the most difficult. Uh, I think you could throw maybe the book of Hebrews in there just by the sheer volume of the arguments that are mentioned in the book of Hebrews, but certainly the book of Romans... Uh, can be a challenging book. And we're going to notice in just a moment that the New Testament actually acknowledges that. And we'll see that here in just a moment. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, the congregation at Rome, contrary to some claims, was not started by an apostle. Uh, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 11, Paul says that he longs to see them, and notice why, that he may impart unto them some spiritual gift to the end that they may be established. The implication is that Rome had not been given by the laying on of the apostles' hands miraculous gifts. That means an apostle hadn't been there. Uh, you remember in Acts chapter 8 when uh, the Samaritans uh, obeyed the gospel and immediately after that they waited for the apostles to get there so that they could lay hands on them and impart miraculous gifts. It's apparent that Paul wanted to go to Rome so that he could do the same thing for them. And it had as of yet not happened. That means also by implication that Peter did not establish the congregation at Rome, which by implication also means that Peter was not the first pope. And so a lot of the things that are claimed relative to the congregation at Rome are false when you really start to think about it. Uh, of course, as one of my children pointed out just a few days ago, uh, Peter was not the first pope. Peter had a wife. Uh, at least Peter had a mother-in-law, which bless his heart if he had a mother-in-law and no wife. Um, but <laughs> it took a while for that one. Um, but his wife's mother was sick and Jesus healed her. So anyway, we recognize the congregation at Rome was not begun by an apostle. Many believe that uh, in Acts uh, chapter 8, as they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, uh, that the gospel came to Rome uh, via that scattering abroad. And that might very well have been the case. I wanted to throw up here, because I didn't know where to put it, uh, a list of, and it's probably too small in type to see, uh, a list of all of the heresies that can be traced back to Rome. Rome, of course, has become the center of the Catholic Church, and, and because of that, uh, a good number of the false teachings in modern history have come from that place. But uh, notice how early they began. 120 A.D., the advocation for the use of holy water. 157, the advocation of penance, that is paying for your transgressions. 394, uh, mass, which is the repeated coming down to earth of Jesus Christ. 588, healing and forgiveness given by and only by the priests began to be a practice. 593, the teaching of purgatory uh, centered at Rome. 666, uh, the use, the introduction of instrumental music and worship. Uh, interesting that that date and that number uh, is associated with that. 709, kissing of the Pope's toe having a special significance. 81,000 transubstantiation, that is that uh, the fruit of the vine and the bread literally turn into the body and blood of Jesus. We spoke about that here a few months ago. And you can see many of the other things that came out from Catholicism and they had their roots in Rome. Uh, coming into 1870, uh, the infallibility, the perfection of the Pope. And we see that even carried on today. But as we look at the epistle that has nothing to do with all of the air that came out uh, of Rome uh, in the years that would follow, as we look at the epistle, there really is one main idea to the Roman epistle, and it is justification. How does a person become justified? 
justified before God. Before we move any farther, before we get into the, to the, the meat of our sermon, we need to talk about justification and what it is. Someone has uh, cleverly defined being justified as in essence being just as if I had never sinned. And so that really is the idea of justification. Uh, a synonym for justification is innocence. And so how do I become innocent once I have sinned? As we think about it, even separate and apart uh, from the teaching of the New Testament, there are two ways to be innocent. The first is to never have sinned and therefore have no need for justification. The second is to be justified through some means that God offers. Those are the only two options that we have. And the book of Romans sets out to prove, number one, false. And number two, how God has provided us a means to be justified. And so that's really the gist of the book of Romans. And so justification is going to be the guiding idea, the guiding word that we use this evening to examine the book of Romans. And it falls into several categories. First of all, we're going to notice, and this is uh, chapters 1 and 2 and the first part of chapter 3, we're going to notice, number one, that justification is something everybody needs. Everybody needs justification. And Paul's everybody generally includes, from a general standpoint, two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. You see, the congregation at Rome would have been primarily made up of Gentile Christians, converts out of the Gentile world, but it would have also included Jewish Christians. And even if it mostly included Gentile Christians, there was this tension between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. And the Jewish Christians looked at the Gentile Christians as, as lesser because they did not uh, adopt the Jewish faith. Sometimes that was the case. And then the Gentile Christians would look at the Jewish Christians as seeming to be entitled because of their background in Judaism. And so Paul sets out to prove in at least the, most of the first three chapters of Romans, hey, everybody needs to be justified. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, everybody needs to be forgiven. Notice the thesis of the whole book. And it alludes to these first three chapters. Romans 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. How does one learn what to do to be justified? The Word of God. There's no other source to find justification but the Word of God. There's not a single other source that you can go to. The Word of God gives me everything I need in order to be justified. But notice that it comes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Everybody needs it. If you're a Jew, you need to go to the Word of God to find out how to be justified. If you're a Gentile, you go to the same Word and you receive the same justification. And that's the main idea that Paul is trying to get across in these first few chapters of the book. In chapter 1, Gentiles need justification. And in particular, as we pick up in verse 18 and as we march through the rest of chapter 1, they need justification. You're familiar with verse 18 through verse 21. Notice as we pick up there, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And then notice what he says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. He begins by saying, even the Gentiles have been shown God's way. And of course, if we trace all of humanity back to first Adam and Eve and then to Noah, it is certainly the case that every human being should have, if their pre predecessors, if their forefathers had done their job, they should have been introduced to the God of heaven. But the problem is, over time, as society splits and splinters, this group forgets God and this group forgets God. And that's not God's fault, that's man's fault. But he says, look, God has showed to everybody who He is. And then you take specific instances, Jonah going to the Ninevites, for instance, where God specifically communicated with the Gentiles. And then he goes even a step farther in verse 20. And he says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. 
being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You should understand that God exists just by looking at the world. And certainly that is the case. And we talked about why I believe last Sunday. We recognized then that the Gentiles had no excuse for not knowing God. God had revealed Himself to them in the past and even nature points them towards Almighty God. But what had they done instead? Well, they'd raised up their own desires as their standard. We could pick up in verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. The most of the world who has rejected God, what do they worship? They worship nature. They worship birds and animals and, and, and earth itself. And we see that in so many world religions even today. But they took it even a step farther than that. Not only did they begin to, to, to worship nature, but they began to dishonor, verse 24, their own bodies between themselves. And he talks about homosexuality and, and rampant uh, uh, sexual sin going on throughout the Gentile world. And he says, For this God, cause God gave them up unto vile affections. They went so far away from God that there was nothing God could do. Their sin took them away from God. They were led by their own desires. And so that's the position that the Gentiles were in and, and therefore they need justification. Here they are worshiping the creation instead of the Creator, raising their own lusts and desires up as their standard for living and therefore they needed justification. And the whole while the Jew is saying, you go get them. Yeah, you tell them about that, Paul. But then he changes his focus in chapter 2. See, it's not only the Gentile that needed forgiveness and justification. In chapter 2, all the way to verse 8 of chapter 3, the Jew needs it too. Notice how it begins in verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable. And then notice those next two words, O man. That's a Jewish greeting, one Jew to another. And so he says, yeah, these Gentiles needed forgiveness, but so do you, you Jew. Whosoever you are that judgest, for wherefore, wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing. He says, you Jews are pointing fingers at the Gentile world for all of their transgressions, and you commit the same sins. But you believe because you're Jews, you don't need justification. And Paul says, that's wrong. You know, do sometimes... People in the body of Christ excuse their own sin while condemning that same sin in others because they say, oh, we're members of the church and it doesn't matter. That's the attitude that the Jews had. And they would look down on those Gentiles for committing the same transgressions that they committed. They did not judge themselves by the same standard that they judged the world. But God wants there to be no mistake through the Apostle Paul that, God, that He holds the Jew and the Gentile to the same standard. Pick up in verse 6. He says, God, verse 5, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Everybody's going to be judged by the same standard. Everybody has to go to the same word to find salvation and justification. The Jew, the Gentile, and every person needs justification. And what a powerful point Paul makes as he opens the epistle. There is not a person in the world who has reached the age of accountability that does not need justification. The, Jew, the Gentile needs it, the Jew needs it, and then his conclusion... And this is a little bit later on in chapter 3. Romans 3 and verse 23, For all have sinned and fallen short, come short of the glory of God. I want us to pause right here and I want us to understand Paul's first point. If you are here this evening, if you are within the sound of my voice watching online this evening, and you have reached an age where you understand what sin is and its consequences, you need justification. And it only comes through God. And that's Paul's first point. Everybody must be justified 
through the Word of God by the means that He sets forth. So justification is something that all people need, number one. Number two, it happens by faith. And unmistakably, Paul sets forth justification by faith. But before we get into it, we've got to clear some things up because this is among some of the most challenging and difficult passages in the Bible. It really is. And I told you in the introduction that the New Testament understands that this is difficult. Listen to what Peter says. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, is written unto you. Now listen to this. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, Peter says, some of the things that Paul writes are challenging. And he says, here's what some people do which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Dear friends, no passage of Paul's writing has been any more rested and twisted than Romans 3 through 5. I dare say there, is, there are very few passages that have been as misused as this. And you know where it really began? It began, it began with Martin Luther. Martin Luther had what he called the Tower Discovery. And he was reading through the book of Romans. And he was disillusioned with the Catholic Church. And he, had, he, had, uh, you know, he eventually had those 95 theses that he nailed uh, to uh, the church house door, outlining all of his disagreements with the Catholic Church at the, of the day. And he had his Tower Discovery as he was reading the book of Romans and he had this epiphany in his own mind that justification is by faith. But then he adds an idea. By faith only. And he took that he believed primarily from the book of Romans and in particular the passage that's before us right now. So we need to go ahead and clear some things up before we move forward. You see, Paul does not teach in Romans 3 through 5 that justification is by faith only. I want you to look at Romans 3.28. If you were to read this by Martin Luther's translation, here's what it would say. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith only. He would insert the word only without or outside of the deeds of the law. He would put that in there because he believed that that should be in there. The problem is it's not in the text. And nowhere in the Bible does it ever say we are saved or justified by faith alone or by faith only. In fact, the only time in all of the New Testament that it mentions faith only or faith alone is James chapter 2 when it says not by faith alone. Not by faith only. So we recognize that that's not contained in the pages of the book of Romans or the New Testament anywhere. In chapter 4 and verse 3... It says, For what saith the Scriptures, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And Paul uses that, art, that as the basis of his argument in chapter 4. But let me tell you what's interesting. James uses that same passage to teach that faith without works is dead being alone in James chapter 2. So unless we want to pit Paul against James, two inspired authors of the New Testament, we have to concede that Paul is not teaching faith only. One of the things that Martin Luther gets tripped up on, and I want you to remember, Martin Luther was disillusioned with the works-based faith of the Catholic Church. And I'm talking about a works-based religion. If Mark Parker wants to sin tomorrow, he can stop by the priest today and prepay for his sins. That's how works-based the Catholic Church had become. And so Martin Luther, in, in a reaction against that works-based religion, went all the way to the other side and said it must be by faith only without any works at all. But the works talked about in Romans is not the works of obedience. It's not baptism for the remission of sins. It's not repentance. It's number one, the work of circumcision. If you look at Romans chapter 3, notice how many times he mentions circumcision. 
Verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law, that's the old law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. In chapter 3, he mentions the Old Testament law. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, the Old Testament law. And then in chapter 4, circumcision. And he mentions it over and over again in Romans chapter 4. Verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, so on and so forth. And his point is simply this. If you think being a Jew saves you, and one of the key elements of being a Jew was circumcision, how do you explain the fact that Abraham was justified before he was circumcised? That's the argument of Romans chapter 4. A good Jew says, hey, my circumcision is a sign that I'm justified by God. And Paul says, wait a minute. Abraham was told he was justified before he was ever circumcised. So that doesn't hold any weight. That's Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 3 says, if you're a Jew practicing the old law, there's no justification in the old law anymore. See, that's the argument of Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5, but we get so bogged down by what so many people have rested and twisted this to mean that we get confused. But justification is by faith. And what is ultimately taught by Romans 3 through Romans 5 is that our obedient faith provides the opportunity for justification, for salvation. Look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now look at verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. If you want to access grace, imagine that, that you were staring at a door and that door was locked and behind that door was grace. And you wanted to access grace. You know what the key is that opens that door? Paul just told you what it is. What is it? It's faith. It's not the old law. It's not circumcision. The, the, the key that opens the door to grace is faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. And you see, he's talking to the Jew when he says that. And we lose sight of the context of what he's saying. Our obedient faith provides access to the opportunity for salvation. That's what this passage is teaching, number one. Number two, this passage is teaching that that opportunity is not offered because of my merit. I think I'm a pretty decent guy. I do. But my decency doesn't merit the opportunity for grace. I don't deserve it. How do I know that? Go to Romans 5. Romans 5, if you look at verse number 6, For when we were yet without Christ, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commends His love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, the point of Romans 3, 4, and 5 is that I can't look at my own works. Look, I'm circumcised, so I deserve grace. Look, I've gone to the temple and I've sacrificed, so I deserve grace. Look, I'm a Jew. I was born into the old law. I deserve grace. Paul says it doesn't work like that. Jesus Christ died to provide the whole world the opportunity and you access it by your faith in Christ. See, that's the point that Paul is making. Number three, the only way to access that, the only source of justification and salvation is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There is no other means. He says, we recognize Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, being now justified by His blood. See, I need the blood of Christ to be justified. Not the blood of the Old Testament sacrifices. Not circumcision. I need the blood of Christ. And that's what Paul is trying to teach. And as challenging as it may be, we must keep in mind those overarching ideas. Number one, justification is needed by everybody. Number two, justification is by faith. Number three, as we move into chapters 6 through 8, justification can happen despite the threat of sin. And sin is everywhere. 
And temptation is all around us. And the potential to sin never leaves. Didn't John write that in 1 John chapter 1? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Look, the potential's there, so how do we reconcile the potential to sin and the ability to be justified? Well, in Romans chapter 6, I want you to notice what the Gentile Christian said. Hey, I can imagine some Gentile Christian writing to Paul and saying, Hey, Paul, I've been thinking. If my sin gave Jesus a chance to provide grace, what if I sin a bunch? Won't that prove God's grace even more? You say, is that really what it says? Read Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Maybe if I sin more, I can demonstrate God's grace even more. And Paul said it doesn't work that way. The Christian who has found justification, his goal in life now is to remove himself from sin. And that's Romans chapter 6. He says in verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We cannot live a life as slave to sin. And do we understand the difference between committing an isolated act of sin and being a slave to sin? Do we understand the difference between that? Is there a difference between lying once and being a liar? Is there a difference? Well, it depends on whether we repent and it depends on whether or not we make a habit out of it. Sin should not reign in our mortal bodies. We should not be slaves to sin. Our job should be to avoid sin, recognizing that there may be a time when we give in. But when we do, we repent. And we get back up and we live as God would have us to. And so the, the tenor of Romans 6 is, we should be servants to God, not slaves to sin. Number 2, Romans chapter 7. And I think Romans chapter 7 is the most difficult passage in all of Romans. To really get a grasp on what it's saying. You know, he talks about this battle between the spirit and the flesh. And we, we mentioned that same thing in Galatians chapter 5. This battle between the spirit and the flesh. And, and without getting too deep into Romans chapter 7, I think one of the things he's hinting at is the fact that sin is a real possibility even in the life of a Christian. Are you ever going to defeat the possibility for sin? Well, no. I don't care how long I live upon this earth and, and how much I dedicate myself to living as God would have me to live. The potential for sin will still be there. And Paul describes that wrestle with sin. And his ultimate question is found in Romans 7 and verse 24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It's as if he's looking at himself as a man lost to sin under the old law and he says, what can I do about it? Under the old law, ultimately, what can he do about it? Nothing. Without Jesus, nothing. But then he says, but wait. Verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What can I do about it? Jesus Christ. That's what I can do about sin. Romans chapter 6, can't be a slave to sin. Romans chapter 7, the potential to sin is still there. Romans chapter 8, the place to find shelter from sin is in Christ. Paul in Romans 8 tells us, did you know you can be a joint heir with Christ? You can be a brother or sister to Jesus. He tells us that in Romans chapter 8. And he says, did you know that if you are in Christ, there is not a single thing that can threaten your soul if you don't allow it? One of my favorite passages is Romans chapter 8. And it almost gives me goosebumps every time I, I read through it. Pick up in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then he says, for I am persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, heights, depth, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are bombarded by sin, but in Christ we have shelter. 
And that's Paul's point in Romans 8. We live as Christians in the midst of a world of sin. We can't be slaves to it, chapter 6. The potential to give in to it is still there, chapter 7. And chapter 8, bunker yourself in Christ Jesus if you want to be sheltered from sin and its effects. Justification despite sin. He turns his attention back in chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11 to these Jews. Because here's what the Jews are thinking. Chapter 11 and verse 1, here's their question. As Paul has been talking mostly to a Gentile audience, he anticipates a question from the Jews. I say then, has God cast away His people? Has God just forgotten about the Jews? All these centuries that He's been leading the Jews through the wilderness, propping them up in the land of promise, taking them into captivity, bringing back a remnant, has He just now forgotten, them, forgotten us altogether? And what is His next phrase? God forbid. Look, Jews can still be saved. But what do they have to do? The same thing the Gentiles do. And you've got to put away your pride and acknowledge that. That Jew, you thought you think you're so much better than everybody else, and now here in Christ Jesus, we're all the same. And you don't have any privilege to speak of except that you had a previous relationship with God before the gospel came into the world. In chapter 9, he makes the argument that really God can accept any group he wants. He says, hey Jew, do you remember that God chose Isaac? You remember that? He chose him. He chose uh, Jacob. Do you remember that? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Do you, do, do you remember that? Well, now God has chosen the Gentiles to be the primary audience of the gospel. And who are you to complain about that? That's chapter 9. In chapter 10, he says, Jew, you know what you have to do in order to be saved? Believe. Same thing a Gentile does. You have to have faith in the gospel message and you have to obey it. Same as the Gentile. And in chapter 11, he says, Gentile and Jew, you better learn to get along together because if you're going to be saved, it's going to be in the same body. You're going to be grafted into the same plant. You know, it's been said about Christians, if you don't like being around each other now, you really won't like heaven. Well, that's what Paul says to the Jew and Gentile. Look, you're grafted in together, you better get used to it. If you're a Jewish Christian or a Gentile Christian, that's chapter 11. So he addresses those Jews and says, Hey Jew, don't you get too haughty, but understand that God can save you as well. And then he goes back and he, he references the fact very, very clearly and, and concisely that, hey, there were 7,000 who had not bowed their knees to Baal in Elijah's day. And there are still Jews who want to do the right thing, who want to obey the gospel. Paul says, I'm one of them. And we understand that tonight. Now, here's where the practical application comes in. From chapter 12 to chapter 16, now we have justification applied to life. We absolutely do. And chapter 12 is one of the most rich, practical chapters in all of the Bible. I've preached from Romans chapter 12 before, beginning in verse 9 all the way to, to verse 21. And there's a lot of practical teaching in Romans chapter 12. It almost reads like the Sermon on the Mount, like a mini Sermon on the Mount from the inspired pen of Paul. And so Romans chapter 12, though, starts with the thesis of Christian living. Notice what he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. He says, Christian, I want you to understand that your job, since we don't live in a, in a system that requires consistent sacrifice of a physical nature, you are the sacrifice. Your body and your life are the sacrifice that God demands. Be a sacrifice. That's the first part of verse 1. Second part of verse 1. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or logical service. After all that God has done for you to provide justification, is it any wonder that He expects your life in return? It's your expected service. So do it. 
Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's the first thing he says. Number two, verse two, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, not only do you need to present your body a living sacrifice, but you need to make tangible, practical change. Do not be conformed, but transform. What a powerful statement. Dear friend, if your life doesn't look different once you become a Christian, after all of that sin is removed, then is your life really meeting the qualifications here in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2? But notice he says, be transformed how? How does it happen? I talked this morning about how difficult it is to change people. But you know how people change? They change their mind. The reason it's so difficult is because you have to rewire your brain. And you can do it. It just takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of determination and a lot of willpower. And that's what Paul is calling for us to give when we begin this practical section of the book of Romans. So that's the thesis of Christian living. Romans chapter 12 talks about practical living. Romans chapter 13 talks about obedience to the government. And I think we need to hear that more often. What is our obligation to the government? To do everything it tells us to do as long as it doesn't conflict with God's will. That's our job. You know, and in today's political world, and especially as we approach an election, it's so easy to get religion and politics confused. There are aspects of politics that absolutely must be involved in the Christian's life. Issues like abortion... Issues like homosexuality and same-sex marriage. Those types of issues must be front and center in the mind and in the ideas of a Christian when we go to vote. But dear friends, no matter what happens, we're Christians. No matter who's elected, we're Christians. And our obligation to the government, inasmuch as it does not conflict with the Word of God, does not change. Did you know that God really only has a few things that, that He says the Christian should expect out of the government as a Christian? I'm not talking about as a citizen, as a voter. As a Christian, what should we expect out of the government? Romans 13 says, punish evildoers. The government should do that. Pass laws that protect its citizens. Punish those who are evil. Okay, that's the job of government. But then Paul says, you know what he tells Timothy to pray for relative to the government? I believe this is 1 Timothy chapter 3 that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. Leave us Christians alone. Let us worship. How many times have I heard Christian men get in the pulpit and pray, thank you that we have this opportunity to come here and, and worship without the fear of being persecuted in any way. That's the single greatest thing that our government can do for us is protect that right. Protect our right to worship God the way that the New Testament directs. Romans 13 says, above and beyond those basic things, it's our obligation as long as it does not conflict with the Word of God to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man. Chapter 14, we need to respect everybody's conscience. If you're in Christ and you have a, you're a weak brother and I'm a strong brother... We need to learn how to coexist. And I don't need to do anything that causes you to stumble. We've talked about that before from passages in 1 Corinthians as well. Paul addresses that there as well. But in Romans chapter 14, he talks about the conscience. In Romans chapter 15, he encourages us to support and also to challenge and admonish one another. And I wish we had time to get into that in greater detail but it's our obligation to lift each other up. In chapter 16, he has his commendations. I commend you to Phoebe. He talks about many of the people that he's come in contact with, and he recognizes those who are faithful in the various places where he is. So let's bring all of this together tonight. The book of Romans is a challenging book. I've not been able to really touch the hem of the garment but if you remember anything about the book of Romans, here it is. Number one, everybody needs justification. I don't care who you are. Everybody. There's not a single person who has reached the age of accountability who is exempt 
from needing to be justified. And even after we obey God, there's no arrogance. We don't have the right to say, hmm, I'm better than you. Luke 17 and verse 10, Jesus says, when you've done all, here's what you can say. I'm an unprofitable servant. I've done that which was my duty to do. Imagine that you're a dishwasher at a restaurant and you go in and you wash your dishes and you go to your boss and say, boss, I need a raise. He says, why? Because I just washed the dishes. Good. You've done what I pay you to do. Why do you need anything extra? When we've done everything that God commands of us, we can't say, see, I've merited salvation. It's still by faith through grace. And that's what Paul is trying to let us understand in that middle part of the book of Romans. Number three, though sin is a potential problem for all of us, we cannot let it and we must not let it rule our lives. Dear friend, if you're a Christian here tonight and you have sinned, you've got an option right now. You can repent of that sin as publicly as it's been committed and you can stop it dead in its tracks. Or you can give that sin place in your life. You can let it start to rule your decision making. You can let it start to rule the path that your life takes. And then you've become a slave to sin. And Paul says, how can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? But dear friend, let me say this. If you have faith, true biblical faith, it ought to change your life. It ought to show in everything that you do. It ought to come out of every pore and every action of your life. Tonight, we skip through Romans chapter 6. But Paul says, Know you not that as many as have been baptized into Christ have been baptized where? Into His death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Have you done that tonight? Have you been baptized into His death and raised to walk a new life? Paul says, the Christian, that has to have been something they did. Have you done that? If not, do it tonight. We can help you. We're ready. The baptistry stands ready right now to baptize you into Christ for the remission of your sins. But dear Christian, does your life look like it ought to as we read in the pages of the book of Romans? Not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. A servant to God, not a slave to sin. If not, let's make it right. Obey the gospel to be restored as together we stand and sing.